I would simply say, you're not half as grateful to be here as I am. <laughs> for, uh, for reasons that will become clear. Um, a little backstory, I made my bones in education and science, information science mostly. Um, I do almost nothing in public anymore that has to do with my professional interests. Um, the stories I have to tell you are just simple personal stories. Uh, this past year has been the, the best of times and the worst of times for Nina and me. We've been dealing with two impossible situations. Um, and interestingly, they both involve uh, miracles at the frontiers of science and medicine. And I never expected them to come uh, crashing together the way they have. Very difficult for me to talk about them or think about them because uh, of what we're going through. So let me just plow through the pictures. Um, <clears throat> The first miracle has to do with, uh, well, I'll give you the punchline. Uh, Nina and I spent 13 years trying and failing to start a family uh, until last December when it finally worked. Uh, we thought science was going to deliver for us. We got to be really good at IVF. Uh, we tried it on several continents with multiple doctors. We're, we're canoisers of in vitro fertilization. but. Um, uh, but it took 13 years. And then that little brat who's squabbling in the back decided to arrive a month early. So I'm getting ahead of the story here. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the fill-in, because uh, first of all, you can't start a family without, uh, without a couple of parents. And it was almost 20 years ago that I met Nina. She's right in the middle of the picture here. There she is. Um, I was doing some charity work in Cambodia. That was me when I was young and foolish. Um, it involved photography and building schools and things like that. I had a parallel project in Bhutan. Um, all of these, in, a, in an odd way, involved uh, kind of dissemination of technology into far corners and, and cultures in the world to see, you know, how things would develop. So we did a big photography project in Bhutan, in the course of which I ran into this interesting young girl. Her name is Choki. Uh, long story, very short. She was the oldest of four kids in her family. Um, by the way, we wound up producing a, an enormous book about Bhutan. Got a Guinness World Record because it's, you know, five by seven feet and 150 pounds. Um, well, you don't get a Guinness Record for nothing, really. Um, <laughs> uh, and we put it up for sale on Amazon. Very amusing story. I didn't know how you sell a book. So uh, I just called Jeff Bezos, since that's what he does. And I said, hey, Jeff, I think you really can be the world's largest bookseller. And he said, well, I already am. Um, <laughs> I said, no, 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 I mean, a little more literally. And, and he helped us out greatly. It was a $20,000 book. All the proceeds went to educational charity in Bhutan. It was a fantastically wonderful project. The photographs were, by and large, taken by the kids. These two kids, primarily, Choki and Gelsi. Um, anyway, the, the long story that I was supposed to make short is that uh, a couple weeks before Christmas in um, whatever the year was, uh, I got a phone call from Choki. Her father had suddenly dropped dead. He was 38, traumatic kidney failure. What will become of us? You've never heard such heartbreak crackling over a 13,000 mile connection. Um, so I scrapped whatever my holiday plans were. I flew to the Himalayas. I gave the family enough money so that they would be comfortable for several years and uh, told Choki not to worry that we'd we'd help her out, even though I couldn't really step in as a father. Uh, but we did wind up bringing Choki to the United States uh, when she was old enough, helped her finish her education there and, and then back in Bhutan and kind of got her launched into a, into a life. I think you see a little more about that. But so there I was in Asia with nothing to do, and I still had a couple weeks left on my return ticket, and I thought, well, I think I'll send a note to Nina. I don't know why I thought of doing that, but I had remembered when I met Nina that I just thought she was, well, I liked what I saw, and in a nice way. Um, <laughs> so, so I sent her an email, and to my amazement, she sent a note back saying, uh, why don't you come to Phnom Penh? Uh, my best friend is getting married on New Year's Eve, and you can be my date. So I parachuted into this wedding. I'd had a tuxedo made as I was traveling through Bangkok, and that's Nina with some friends. There I am in my ill-fitting Thai black silk jacket. And uh, that was sort of the beginning. We spent New Year's Day just puttering around Phnom Penh. I remember everything like it was yesterday. 
temples. The <sighs> One of our first dates in the United States, strangely enough, was at the conference that Saul mentioned in LA, EG, uh, where she heard me play a little duet with Yo-Yo Ma. That was very memorable. Uh, Yo-Yo got the hug from Richard. I just sort of got a scowl. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we took advantage of the photographer who was there, uh, who snapped in a bunch of nice pictures, which I treasure, we both treasure. And we wound up on postage stamps in Bhutan for reasons that are a little too hard. That's a different story, but... Um, <laughs> Anyway, we kept seeing each other, and I thought, well, this is going along pretty well. I've got to go to the Olympics in uh, Italy, so Nina, would you like to come to Torino? And so we flew to Italy and, and attended the Winter Olympics Games. Uh, very nice, and, uh, and things were sort of heating up. And, uh, and then I learned that she hadn't successfully yet divorced her husband, because the Cambodian legal system is sort of like a Marx Brothers farce of, of the American legal system, and you know what a farce that is. Um, so uh, it was just dragging on, and there was no telling how long the divorce would linger in Cambodia, but I figured, what the hell, that's just a lope. That's why they made Venice. So uh, we flew to Venice, and Nina was looking smoldery and beautiful, and I was looking like a dork, as I usually do. Um, uh, we got a nice... Uh, Sweet at the Danielli had champagne and flowers and all this, th and rings. We swapped rings, promise rings. And we promised each other that if the divorce ever did come through, that we would consider getting married for real. Uh, and so we did. Uh, it was just three years later, <laughs> waiting for the divorce. Um, and we had to pick a place to get married. And by that point, Nina had been to Bhutan a few times and loved it there, found it to be a place of family. Uh, and it feels like that, incidentally. Uh, one of the curious things is when you're traveling in that country, there's no uh, notion of a surname. Uh, when you're born, you typically are assigned two names, like Choki Lamo or Peldon Sering or something like that, by, by a monk. And so there's no Smith or Jones. And it's very perplexing to meet uh, children and not know which family they belong to. But families tend to be more fluid anyway for, for other reasons. Uh, and so part of the upshot is you, you bump into little kids and they all address you as auntie or uncle. And statistically, they're probably right. Um, <laughs> small country, 600,000 people. Uh, so we felt very much at home there, and I'd been spending a great deal of time there anyway. Um, we, we thought, you know, let's not get married in Cambodia because she'd already been there and done that. And if we'd been married in the United States, it would have been a hardship to our Asian friends. So we, we just figured out, screw all of you. We'll, we'll go to Bhutan and nobody will come. So we got married, had to send out the wedding invitations, uh, and the postage stamps wound up coming in handy. I, you know, kept them for four years in a box, but there you go, there's our wedding. Um, you know, spooky, graven idols and all of that. It was, and I'm still as clueless as ever. Um, <laughs> There then followed a 10-year fallow period of uh, struggles with infertility. And uh, this is an unfair picture to show because it's just me. And Nina, um, as any woman would in this kind of situation, um, bore the brunt of it. But it's not easy for either partner. And it's difficult for me to put into words uh, what it feels like to keep stepping up to the plate you know, with high hopes and taking a swing and then there's a miscarriage, or then there's another failure for 10 years. Um, we, uh, Nina, found a wonderful counselor who specializes in this new zone, uh, which has come into existence ever since IVF. People count on this as a way to solve their problems, and it turns out it creates other problems that hadn't really existed emotionally before. So uh, that therapist was a godsend for us, and she, along with our fertility doctor, persuaded us to try one last roll of the dice. And so we agreed, this would be the final time. We wouldn't put ourselves through another calamity. I didn't think our relationship would survive it, to be honest. <coughs> so um, we flew to California. This is our, our last shot, our last embryo. Uh, and oh, a little digression. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is rather interesting, and I hadn't thought of this even after my first nine years of IVF experiences. Uh, when you do pre-implantation genetic screening of a five-day-old embryo, five-day-old embryo has about 100 cells in it, so you pluck out one little cell and do a battery of 1,000 genomic tests 
to see what the weaknesses are. And at that point, we sat down with our doctor and he said, okay, I've got a spreadsheet here. We fertilized 18 eggs. Uh, three of them have serious chromosomal aberrations and they wouldn't be viable. Uh, another six have genetic frailties that we don't like so much, but we've ranked the other nine in order of robustness, most likely to succeed, and, and they're good to go. So, would, let's start with a simple question. He says, would you rather have a boy or a girl or flip a coin? And I thought about that and I said, well, uh, that's good. Do we know which ones are gonna be good at, you know, French or math or, you know, and he said, we're not quite there yet, but let's talk about gender. Nina said, flip a coin, get going, what's ever on top of the list? And I said, well, hang on, I'm nine years older than you. And uh, actuarially speaking, I'm likelier to, um, to move on before you are. And so if that happens, would I rather leave you behind with a son or a daughter? And I said, you know, I lean slightly towards a girl because, uh, you know, a son is a son till he takes a wife, a daughter's a daughter for the rest of her life. There's a sort of importance to those sayings. And, and it's a fact that girls are better caregivers for aging parents than boys are. And we're aging parents. I wasn't expecting to be a dad in my late 50s. So I leaned slightly towards having a girl. We tried that twice and struck out, but with, with our last embryo, which was a male, um, we went for it, and uh, that was the transfer. And uh, three weeks later, we went in for a, an ultrasound, expecting nothing. We were conditioned for more failure, and, uh, and so imagine my surprise. Was there no sound? There should be sound on this. Holy shit. There it is. <laughs> You got that bit. Pardon your French. Yeah, pardon your French, he says. Mot de Cameron. There you go. French. Um, it worked. Uh, there, by August 14th, it's pretty clear there's a baby uh, on board. Um, you know, ultrasounds are so last millennium. We tried MRI. Um, he looked a little cartoon-like, like a Simpsons character there. Um, well, the due date was 6 January, and I figured, okay, uh, beginning of December, I've got about a month, I can still squeak out to California and get, get a little work done, plan a conference. Uh, I think I will accept that invitation to give a talk at, at Apple's fancy campus. So I did, I showed up to see the building Steve Jobs was never able to um, enjoy, gave my little talk. And then on the morning of um, December 4th, I got a text message from Nina about 9.30 in the morning and she said, I'm just going in for my routine ultrasound, nothing to worry about. Uh, I'll call you later. Ten minutes later, I got a note from her that said it wasn't so routine. Uh, the doctors say there is no amniotic fluid at all. Well, I started <laughs> Googling flights home. Um, a few minutes later, I got another message uh, that uh, they were going to deliver the baby right away. How soon could I get back? to Cambridge, and by then I was already diving into an Uber. I bought my plane ticket from the back seat of the car. I barely caught the flight, uh, 11 a.m. jet blue flight from San Francisco to Boston, and uh, as luck would have it, there was no internet on the damn plane, and so uh, I was in the dark. All I knew was that if you had no amniotic fluid, 80% of the time that meant you were gonna have a stillborn <laughs> kid, which we didn't. <laughs> Nina was ready. Tycho was ready. Um, I was not ready. <laughs> but um, uh, here we are in the hospital. 921. Hey, I landed on the runway at 826. I sprinted off the plane. It was less than an hour, and I was suddenly in scrubs in the operating room. And uh, every time I went around to the business end, they would shuffle me back to where the head end was. But it didn't take long. You know, look at this, 9.34, and then 10 minutes later, there's a little kid out there. And um, I couldn't believe it. Less than an hour and a half off the plane, and I'm doing that. And Nina looked like she was ready to go to dinner. <laughs> I wasn't. I was a basket case. Everything was perfect. I'll tell you one funny story. We were, um, I was alone in the operating, in the NICU with the baby and a whole platoon of 
doctors, well, these guys, they all came in with their carts. It's a little intimidating when a dozen people come in and huddle around a six-pound human. And they were speaking in hushed tones, and I couldn't make out what the hell they were saying. Uh, something about APGAR scores and breathing rates and whatnot, and, and I couldn't get any signal out of the noise. And, uh, and they said, uh, th there was a lull, and one of the nurses says, hey, did you guys actually look at this kid? Because he's unbelievably cute. <laughs> and uh, they keep talking, I'm thinking, that's a little weird. Uh, and then one of the other nurses says, wow, look, he's got a full head of hair. That's so uncommon in preemies. And uh, they keep chatting. And then a, a third one spins around and she addresses me directly and says, nah, your kid's not cute. He's wicked cute. <laughs> and uh, as they were going out, I, I buttonholed one of the doctors there. And I said, okay, nothing shocks me. I'm a scientist. Give it to me straight. Um, what kind of brain damage are we looking at here with a, you know, early arrival? I mean, is he going to be able to speak French or do math or whatever? And uh, he says, I don't know, I can't speak French. Uh, <laughs> and then he says, but all the vital signs are normal, and I looked at all the percentiles, and apparently your son is somewhere between cute and wicked cute, and he goes out the door. Um, so that's about the biggest problem we've had to worry about. Uh, everything else, you know, it has been amazing. And let me just flip through a million. Oh, this is wild. Uh, from his earliest moments. If you push the right button, he knew how to smile. Somewhere up there. There we go. And he's still smiling. He's a great little baby. And um, we brought him home. He's got a whole world of expressions. There he is meeting grandma. Um, cuddling with mom and dad. Uh, you know, I never thought this moment would happen. And I'm not going to say that our miracle is any more miraculous than anybody else's miracle. Um, we went to a Christmas Eve party. Our first little Christmas at home. Doggies. Um, yeah, his Popeye impersonation. Um, we had some Buddhist ceremonies. One of our neighbors, Larry Tribe, got a reprieve from tweeting about Donald Trump for a day and <laughs> came by to talk about this. Or, um, more Buddhist blessings. I've only got a few more thousand baby pictures, by the way, so just bear with me. By the way, that, um, uh, whether you're dining in or dining out, everything works well in the first six months. You know, I, I just throw my napkin over the kid and eat, and uh, not have to worry about it. Um, I keep calling him the kid, but he does have a name. I'm not going to tell you the story of it. Oh, I like that. Proof that miracles happen. It sure is a, it's a goddamn miracle. Um, we dropped by the IVF clinic to visit some of the nurses, many nurses who helped make this happen, because they don't usually get to see the fruits of their work. And, uh, Boy, what a wonderful morning that was. That was Nina's idea. And Tycho gave a very brief talk at EG last year when Saul attended. There he is with you know, three men in safari jackets with a baby, and um, Uncle Aaron, who's well known to all of you. Um, Tycho, yes, that's his name. Uh, you can ask me later, or Nina, about that. Um, it's a miracle. I never thought it would happen. We'd given up hope, but science delivered. So, um, <clears throat> this next twist is amazing. Tycho was five months old. It's the beginning of June. We thought, we owe ourselves a little vacation. Let's go to Portugal. So we go to Portugal. Uh, I wasn't feeling very well, um, but I kind of dragged myself along for the first four or five days. Nina and Tycho with a bizarre prehistoric uh, stone to worship. Um, Tycho entertaining the waitresses and, and our little staff. And there I am with 102 degree fever. Um, but you know, you, you're the dad and you pick up the suitcases and schlep to the next hotel, right? Well, it was bugging me enough that I sent an email to our doctor at Mass General. And he wrote back and said, well, uh, why don't you steal the kid's baby thermometer because surely you brought one of those. And I thought, wow, we did bring one. Why didn't I think of that? And he said, take your temperature. And if it's above 101 still, um, you know, you can call a doctor through the hotel concierge and see what's up. So I was 102, 103, and, um, and we found a doctor. We were way the hell down on the tip of Portugal in the Algarve, and there's a little city called Lagos, um, 
where there's a small, whoops, small hospital. And um, doctor looked at blood and urine and stuff like that and couldn't find anything wrong. Uh, gave me five days of antibiotics, which I took. Um, the fever went away, I felt better, but I didn't have much appetite and I still had crummy digestion. But I figured, you know, bad digestion, that could be the antibiotics talking. So let's just keep, you know, shuffling along. But, you know, it wasn't easy. And, and Nina was saying all the things a partner would say in that circumstance. You've made yourself sick again. You've got a cold. You know, you've got, it, maybe it's a stomach flu. Um, it's ruining our vacation. And I was, you know, trying to keep moving, but it, it, I was having a tough time. And uh, by the time we got to Lisbon, uh, it was a big festival day, and we were looking forward to it, and eating grilled sardines as everybody does as they celebrate Saint Sardine or whatever it is. And, uh, and Nina said, you know, you don't look very well. You should go upstairs and, and lie down. And so I went up with Tycho and had some ginger ale. And, and this was a Thursday night. And on Friday morning, uh, I woke up and I felt awful. Uh, I had horrendous diarrhea and it was bright red. And I thought, that's not good. And then I took a look and I saw this bulge on my belly, and I thought, what the hell is that? And, uh, um, and I started feeling nauseous. We made a beeline for this hospital. I arrived and barfed a couple of times, which upped my priority in the <laughs> urgency queue. Um, long story short, long day short, uh, they gave me a CT scan. There was a large mass blocking my right upper colon. It was about the size of a, of a grapefruit. Well, softball, 10 centimeters. And in very limited English, the doctors said, you are ill and you need surgery right away. Uh, they said, we'd be happy to do it here in Portugal. You'll have to stay an extra four weeks. Uh, but you might still be well enough to fly back to wherever you came from. Where did you come from? And I said, Boston, we can get back there. I called Nina. We scrapped the rest of our trip. And, and on Saturday morning, we flew home. Um, and on Sunday morning, that's in Lisbon, and this is, never mind that stuff. Uh, look, let me just tell you what happened. Um, checked into Mass General, um, and uh, they did some more scans, and it looked bad, and I had to have emergency surgery to save my life. Um, before the emergency surgery, I'm going to get slightly graphic here, I had three of the more unpleasant days of my life, because they decided it would be a fine idea to give me a colonoscopy. And I said, you know, there's a blockage here, and so that little GoPro is not going to get past the blockage in the drain. It, and, and they said, that's okay, just drink this laxative and it'll blow stuff out. Well, you know, when the drain is clogged, when it's really clogged and you don't have Roto-Rooter to call, uh, those thermonuclear laxatives that you take before prep, you know, when you have to attach the seatbelt to the toilet so you don't go ricocheting off the ceiling, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, some of you do. The rest of you should have your damn colonoscopies done. Um, no, it's really important, and I'm getting to the punchline of why. Um, I mean, fuck. I thought I was going to die. Uh, I mean, I was in really bad shape. And I also had the suspicion they were delaying because there was no operating room available, and, uh, which also turned out to be true. On Thursday morning, I had this weird sensation. I, I thought... Maybe a day, maybe two days, maybe this is what it feels like when the fuse is really running out. Because you don't last that long when you have a blockage and when you're eating nothing but ice chips and you're vomiting and all that stuff. Um, well, so a, a crew takes me down to surgery and they say, good news, uh, Dr. Ricciardi will operate on you. Rocco Ricciardi, sounds like a Formula One driver. Well, he's the head of colorectal surgery at Mass General, so he's not a slouch. They wheel this cart uh, into a little bay, and the two anesthesiologists come up to me with their masks, and they start asking me questions. A long list of questions. You know, are you allergic to this? Have you been in a hospital? And I said, look, simple answer. I've never been a patient in a hospital in my entire life, apart from the day I was born. I've had a good run for 57 years. Just give me the anesthesia, give me the fucking surgery, and save my life already, because I'm dying. And all of a sudden, there's this scuffling behind the curtain. The curtain flies open. And there's a woman with sort of frizzy blonde hair being restrained by a nurse. And the nurse says, I'm sorry, doctors, I couldn't hold her back. She was insistent. She had to see this patient. And uh, Mr. Hawley, do you know this woman? And I look up in pain and I say, no, I've never seen this woman in my entire life. 
And she says, but I know who you are. You're Michael Hawley, and I was sent to perform a Jin Shin Jitsu energy field realignment on you before your surgery. And she throws off the nurse and comes barging in and starts waving her hands over my belly. And I think, am I already under? Is this like some <laughs> bad dream? Don't they have security in this hospital? What the fuck is going on here? And I, I send panic looks to the anesthesiologist. I'm trying to telegraph through my eyes. Get her out of here. I need my surgery, please. And I see this anesthesiologist calmly look at his watch, and he's thinking, OK, we got about six minutes, and we can put him under in three. Otherwise, we lose the operating room. OK, you're out. And that was the last thing I remember before I woke up with a foot of, of uh, fishing wire in my belly and minus 18 inches of colon and, and resectioning and replumbing. Um, so uh, the, there was sort of a, a good news bad news thing. Um, the good news, surgery saved my life. The bad news, it was malignant. The good news, there was no cancer at the margin. The bad news, uh, eight out of 20 lymph nodes were pissed off. That means stage 3C, ticket to chemotherapy. Um, this was not a cold. This, this was serious. And uh, July 9th, I had my first meeting with an oncologist, uh, Dave Ryan, who heads oncology at Mass General, specializes in what I have, probably the best guy in the country for me to be working with. Um, <clears throat> so we began chemotherapy uh, in the middle of July, and uh, you know, another new adventure. And th through this whole experience, I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know, uh, chin up and uh, let's go forward. We've, we've got to do what we've got to do. And let's look at the problem and solve the problem. And one of the nice things is that as word spreads about what's happening to you in a situation like this, as you know, or, or hopefully not, may find out, um, people start bending over backwards to send you advice and send you stuff. And one of the things was that folks started sending us THC and CBD products because this solves every problem now. <laughs> and, uh, and I asked our doctor about that and said, you know, it's very interesting. Some THC has been shown to interfere with pathways that anti-tumor meds work on, but you're not going to be taking any of those meds because you don't have those kinds of tumors. So if you want to take that for uh, anxiety, go ahead. And I said, look, I don't have anxiety. What I have is a problem. Let's focus on solving the problem. And he said, good, because if you ever do get anxiety, we have much better medication for that. I said, you know, we'll file that. Um, so we're on the gold standard for chemotherapy, or I should say the platinum standard. The active ingredient in Folfox is oxaliplatin, which contains a lot of platinum. And you know, the idea is to get it to kill the cancer before it kills the patient. And, um, and on, a funny thing happened. Um, Nina wonderfully took me out for a yoga session with uh, an interesting guru. And I'm not the biggest yoga guy, but I'm happy to do everything to c try to keep moving. It wasn't easy, because I was still in pain after the surgery, hard to get out of bed. Um, and I noticed at this yoga night that I could barely get on the mat on all fours. I had this excruciating pain in my ribs. And, uh, um, and and then I couldn't get up. I had to have assistance to get off the mat. And I thought, man, something is really bad. So I contacted the oncologist. He said, come in tomorrow. Let's take a look at it. And he, I was terrified. I thought it was some sort of a metastatic blip in, uh, in a lymph node. And he, he poked around and said, no, I, I don't think it's that. He said, but just to be sure, we'll do a PET CT scan and, and we'll take a closer look. So we did the scan. And he came in and said, um, uh, Bad news, you've got a dozen lesions in your liver. Uh, and uh, I said, oh, so that's stage four metastatic, not just stage three. It's not, it's, this is like serious shit that's gonna kill me. He said, well, uh, not just yet, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, but it's, you know, chemotherapy wasn't supposed to fail. It, it was as if, the cancer said, oh man, this oxaliplatin is great. Let's just spread ourselves around and soak up some more of it. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> um, so we scrambled around to find uh, an interesting drug trial, and we did. Um, as luck would have it, the scientific road may be rising up to meet me just in time. I began immunotherapy on the 10th of September and um, had my second infusion of these meds uh, not too long ago, 8th of October. And um, 
got good news just Tuesday a week ago that the CEA level, which is the marker for cancers in colorectal cancer, had been beaten down from 37 to 17, which is a sign of a strong immune response that this stuff may be working. When, when immunotherapy works, it works really well, and I've, I'll show you very quickly just a, a couple of um, things about that and wrap up. Um, it, uh, there are two other patients on this protocol at Mass General, and they're both in complete remission. What's more, their malignancies have just dissolved like butter. It's like something out of an X-Files episode. And in my case, it seems to be working, but it's not clear you know, how long it works or what happens after you scrub out the current wave of cancer. These cancers are very squirrely diseases, and, um, and so it's a process. I find it interesting that just last year, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to um, Tosco Hanjo and Jim Allison for fundamentally discovering what would make immunotherapies work. Um, I mean, this is up to minute stuff. I find it sobering that if this had happened to me just three years ago, I'd be gone. Um, in fact, it was distressing. <laughs> you know, you, you learn you've, you've got metastatic disease and that chemo has failed, and then there's a little day or two to agonize over the realities. And I combed all the scientific literature, and I knew that my probabilities were measured in single digits, and the expectancy was going to be less than a year. And I suddenly understood why, because this stuff was just going to eat up my liver, and that would be that. You know, you call it a liver, because you can't live without it. Um, for reference, you might Google up the name of Bill Ludwig. This article in the New York Times uh, in 2011 was about Bill and two other patients. Bill was patient number one, the first human subject to receive an immunotherapy trial. Um, he risked everything, had leukemia, and uh, I'll just, I'll give you his punchline. Um, they pulled out some blood, they um, tweaked his T-cells, gave him a personalized injection, the T-cell army self-replicated, billions of them, they went mano a mano, and that was what was gonna happen inside of Bill. For the first week after the injection, though, nothing happened. He just thought a week had gone by, he had three more weeks to live. And uh, suddenly, he breaks out in a massive fever, goes into convulsions. This lasts for 10 days. Uh, they didn't think he'd survive that. They brought in the family to be with him. Um, and just as quickly, those symptoms went away. They took a bone marrow uh, biopsy, and the doctors saw no leukemia at all. And they couldn't believe it. They thought they'd fucked up. So they went in and drilled out another bone marrow biopsy, and again, no leukemia. And they sat down with Bill, and they said, we weren't expecting this, but there is nothing in you anymore. There's no cancer. And he is still cancer-free after all these years. Um, these are amazing discoveries, and here's uh, technically how these uh, chemicals work. They're called... Um, inhibitors, and uh, this animation was given to me over dinner last night by David Bolinsky, of course, and what you'll see are these little purple poiks, um, no laser here, um, and those are proteins. Uh, they're, they're little markers, they're like, they're like locks, and the purple thing is a white blood cell, and it goes up, and it has to touch the other chemical, and to, to prevent it from touching it. I'm not, not doing a good job explaining this because the animation is going by too quickly. I'll, I'll do it with a slide. Um, so it's like a two-key system. Uh, you've got a cell. It could be a body cell or it could be a tumor cell. Uh, the tumor cells pretend to be body cells. They put out the same little locks. Uh, and one of the keys, uh, key locks <laughs> is called PD, which stands for program death because both of those keys are required by the white blood cell, the T cell, uh, in order to safely pass over the cell that it's analyzing. So it will check out both of those receptors, and if they are, seem good, they'll move on to the next cell. But if one of them is bad, if the program death uh, protein is bad, then it destroys uh, that cell because it didn't pass the test, it didn't have the right keys. And that in a nutshell, is what's going on with immunotherapy. You, you inhibit the cancer cells' um, ability to 
fool the T cells. You sort of unmask the cancer cells. And that allows your body's T cells to detect and destroy. And when that war starts to rage, of course you have a spike in temperature and, and get nauseous. So um, we have a, you know, a formula for beating this. Uh, I don't have much of a choice. Baby needs shoes. I'm not going to waste this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so we're state-of-the-art immunotherapy. Uh, for those who follow these things closely, I happen to be a particular genetic uh, flavor called BRAF mutant and microsatellite instability high. I'm getting my honorary PhD in the genomics of colorectal cancer, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, diet has become more Mediterranean and vegan. Uh, I get to do wacky supplements and things later, uh, but right now we're focused on what I would call the real medicine because I'm in a clinical trial and I'd rather not get tossed out of the clinical trial and be deprived of these drugs which are currently saving my life. Um, uh, I need to exercise more, but I finally can. And I'll tell you, it's a funny thing. Um, last Tuesday when we got the good news, uh, two Tuesdays ago, uh, that it seemed like the immunotherapy was working, I reported to my doctor one other thing, which is about 12 days ago, I woke up and I suddenly felt okay for the first time since May. Every damn day since May, I'd felt sort of sickish and kind of bleh, you know? It's the weirdest thing. It was like a light switch had flipped. And the doctor was smiling from ear to ear. And he said, you know, that's very commonly reported by people who are enjoying the right kind of response to this. I didn't know that was reported before I reported it. But, um, but it stands to reason. Um, the bottom four are the Dean Ornish prescription, by the way. Um, better food, better exercise, meditation to manage stress, and above all, love and support of friends uh, and family. And boy, am I blessed in that last regard. I can't believe and I can't even express what, um, <clears throat> what Nina and I have, have gone through, you know. Um, I take a little selfie like this, and I'm surprised at how many times I see these damn hospital bracelets on my arm. I got one because I was at Mass General yesterday afternoon before I came down on the train. I just forget to take these off, like they'll get me free drinks at the bar or something. <laughs> in a backstage pass. But, um, but until just on two Tuesdays ago, when we felt like we'd turned the corner, I couldn't look at a picture like this without sort of feeling like I was disappearing. So <clears throat> I guess the last thing I'd say is that, <clears throat> as I said at the outset, uh, I wouldn't want to put out that my miracles are any more interesting or, or important or miraculous than anybody else's. We all go through struggles. And every once in a while, there's a bit more science to help us through, uh, but certainly a lot more love uh, from friends. And... Um, Well, I'm just grateful, as I said at the beginning, beyond words, to be here and uh, to let you know what we're going through. Um, <clears throat> this cosmic twist of having the baby of our dreams and then having this diagnosis. Uh, <clears throat> it's made me realize that, um, <clears throat> in fact, giving this talk, which I've not given before, kind of obviously, has made me appreciate that um, you know, just as my body has sort of been through the wars, surgery and chemo and, and all the rest, and it's 60 pounds less of me and, and um, kind of barely digesting food after the plumbing was fixed, um, you know, emotionally and, and psychically, I'm still pretty beaten up too. And it's going to take time for, for those things to, to come back. And, and I think um, <clears throat> the best way to to look at these moments in life is that, uh, is that they're a gift um, because they give you empathy. They let you know <clears throat> about things that are more important than you realized. Um, let you relate to people in ways that, that matter the most. Um, so, thank you. <clears throat>